and Nigel Farage and Reform UK could, we're told, be the biggest threat to the Tories at the next general election over their failures to control immigration. This comes as the Home Secretary, James Cleverley, said that the flagship Rwanda plan is not, in his words, the be-all and end-all of government efforts to tackle the record number of people coming into the country illegally. He's making a statement to MPs later today. Well, joining me right now to discuss all of this is Reform UK spokesman Frederick Chedham. Uh, good morning to you, Frederick. Good morning, Julia. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, now, um, I'm, I'm very um, old, old colleague and uh, good friend of uh, Richard Tice, uh, your party leader, but of course, Nigel Farage as well, currently in the jungle in Australia, <laughs> burying <laughs> his bottom. No one needed to see that. Um, and uh, <laughs> just in my Rather head now, can't, can't leave it, can't get rid of it. Um, but uh, And here, I'm no doubt missing a lot of this, uh, of this debate going on. He, of course, still sort of has an honorary role uh, in, in Reform UK. Lots of talk over the weekend that Reform UK is trying to basically win over some existing MPs. Uh, we had uh, one in particular uh, claiming that uh, he uh, was uh, among those. Uh, the, the, this, is the, this, of course, is, uh, is our, good, our good chum, uh, Lee Anderson, who's a Labour, uh, sorry, Tory, what was I saying, Tory uh, deputy chair, saying that he was offered hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, to uh, move over to Reform UK. This has been denied. So what is going on? <laughs> well, I don't know about the £400,000. So he's obviously worth a lot more than I am because no one's offered me <laughs> anything like that at all. But, um, I mean, no, I mean, it's just a sign of the fact that the Tories are scared, aren't they? They are. They're, they're seeing that their combination of broken promises and failure to deliver... Uh, and the fact that it's just not getting any more, and of course the boats which we can come to in immigration, it's just not working. And so they're scared. And of course, of course there are Tory MPs in the party who probably would prefer to move across to a boat that's going in a forward direction rather than one that's sinking. Um, and I think what we are seeing is a, is a natural type of conversation around that. But I think we take it actually as a bit of a compliment it shows that they really are concerned that the rising momentum of reform in the polls is giving them cause for thought. And there is no uh, and doubt, reform, are, reform UK is rising in the polls very slowly, but we are. But the key thing is, as was happened, as happened with the Brexit Party, as happened with the UKIP as well in the, in the past, is that actually any 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 iterations of that part don't need to do very well. Don't even need to win a single MP's constituency seat as long as they have and they're getting enough support that they are splitting the what would have been otherwise a Tory vote and effectively allowing a Labour candidate in. Now, Rishi Sunak's done an interview this weekend saying, look, you know, yeah. if you vote, if you vote for Reform UK, you're basically letting the Labour Party in. But I know an awful lot of people who say, well, so be it then. Either offer us what we think we'll be getting with reform, tighter immigration like, or um, or we will. Be, say, well, well, then fine. Well, we'll push you out of power anyway if you won't listen to us. Do you think that the Conservative Party will start paying more attention to this issue if you continue rising in the polls? Or do you think they'll pay lip service to it and count that on the day it's not a PR system? They'll say it's a wasted vote. If you really don't want Keir Starmer in power, you'll vote for us. Uh, well... You've said it very well, and I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that's exactly what will happen. As they get closer, they will imitate our policies further. There are four steps that the Tories do. First is that they sneer at you and mock you. Then they imitate your policies. Finally, then they accuse you with smears and, uh, and accusations of some form or another. And then finally, they go for Nigel. And that's what will happen on this occasion. This is what they will do. And they will continue to do it because we are offering the policies which they promised and they have failed to deliver. And that has got people to the point now where they are not going to reward failure with further success. It simply won't happen. I wonder, though, if a lot of people would say, well, even if you guys go... I mean, look, we've seen some extraordinary sort of election surprises and shocks in many countries in recent years. Um, you know, Trump onwards, you know, Brexit referendum onwards. Um, a, a lot of people would say, well, you know, what, OK, what if suddenly, you know, Reform UK were in charge? I mean, although we don't have the PR system, would make that more likely than it would in Europe. But, but would you actually renege on those deals as well? Because actually you're all the same. Politicians say what you want to hear. None of you deliver. You're saying exactly the sort of stuff that Boris Johnson was saying, that, you know, Rishinak, everyone's been saying this stuff, and then you don't deliver. 
Well, I don't think so. I mean, who, who knows exactly what the future holds? Uh, the first thing to say is that, you know, reform is fundamentally a startup. We're not defined by this electoral cycle that's going on and this set of arguments that are preceding the, the forthcoming election. We're looking at something slightly more long term than that. And quite rightly so. Every political party starts as a startup. And that's where we are now. We will grow and we will gain those votes. But what I do know is from my conversation with all of my colleagues, there is a huge amount of conviction rather more than political cynicism in the way that we go about our policies. And we really are there to deliver those policies that the people have asked for, that they expected the Conservatives to do, particularly with the 2019, and they haven't. We only exist because the Conservatives have failed. Yes, and so that, we that, that, that is a fair it. point. But it is interesting, actually, that it, it, we are told that in the in the negotiations, the attempts to woo over the likes of Lee, Lee Anderson, um, what what basically that you know that money that was supposedly off, offered, which was which was there's, there's some there's some talk about what what really happened, was basically it was saying it was offering, look, if you do come over and then you're deselected. Uh, in your seat, will basically pay your MP salary for five years so you're not out of pocket to make it easier. Because that's the reality, isn't it? Often, if, a, if someone does defect, they get punished by the electorate um, at, at the next election and they lose out. And a lot of politicians, on a lot of issues, you know, they... They, they've got mortgages, they've got electricity bills to pay, they've got, you know, uh, fat mouths to feed. And actually, a lot of MPs just basically put their careers ahead of their promises to the public. But what's to say that your party isn't any different? Well, because we don't have to. We've got plenty of conviction leaders in here. I mean, what you're talking about there is, 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 is the politics of self-interest. Uh, and yes, and we have a House of Commons that is stuffed with politicians which are full of self-interest, be they financial, ideological or whatever. Well, we're not coming from that position at all. Certainly, I don't know anyone that, that is. We are looking at a system that is broken and we want to put it right. We didn't go into this because many of us could probably find our way into the Conservative Party in more prominent roles if we wanted to and join that little gravy train which they're all trying to protect. But we're not going to do that. Well, hold we on a minute. I mean, Nigel Farage has talked about in a few years' time after he was hailed as you know, the, sort of the, almost like the king from the over the, over the seas uh, through party conference a couple of months ago. He, he's talked about how he could be leader of the Conservative Party. Do you think that's even likely? Well, it's an interesting point. I mean, personally, I'm not so sure. Having uh, no, n knowing knowing the man slightly as I do, I, I I don't think that's right. I think it's more conviction of him. But certainly, from the Conservatives' point of view, if they had to choose this morning between Nigel Farage or Tobias Elwood as a, as an electoral asset, we know which one they would choose, and that is because they fear him. And he certainly comes from the for conviction side of politics. And I'm certainly not going to uh, dispute anyone's motives from that point of view. All I see is a group of people of which Nigel is probably the most prominent who want to put the political system in this country right, who want to fulfil what people have asked us to do, mm. who are, want us to fulfil what they asked the Conservatives to do, but yeah. couldn't do it with an 80-seat majority. What, so it's time for something else. Not what do you make of these maybe. claims about, you know, that the, she's not reneging on this deal with Suella Brahman, and more importantly, reneging, as she made it quite clear in her resignation letter, you know, reneging on his deal with the British people in terms of dealing with migration. She claims there was a salary threshold agreed, there were numbers agreed, a, um, a, a four-point migration plan, she she claims the Prime Minister agreed to. Um, we have seen that migration hit a record. I mean, it's just these numbers are just off the scale. 745,000 in the year to the end of December 2022, three mm. times what we had pre Brexit, um, blowing apart that manifesto commitment of Boris Johnson's in 2019 to reduce overall numbers below 239,000. We were talking about the latest figures for. Um, for the, the June till June 2023 on the show on Thursday, and again that was over 700,000. Originally, those figures we thought were going to be 606,000. They were even higher. I mean, I find it extraordinary that we don't know how many people are in the country from abroad at any on any given day. There should be a computer that tells you exactly how many are here, who haven't gone home, who's still here. I find it extraordinary, given all the documentation we have to have, that that isn't the case. But I mean, those numbers, no one sane thinks those numbers are sustainable. Of course they're not. And what we're looking at is three decades, decades of political failure. You know, it started off with Blair, with his Open Society, with his Human Rights Act, with his Equal Opportunities Act, with his social contracts, and then go around creating a load of proxy wars which have created international instability. We're reaping the, uh, the, the, the poor reward of three decades of political failure, and the government have legislated themselves into a corner. We now have a Human Rights Act. We are beholden to the ECHR. They are unable to control this problem. The courts control it. The liberal elite in our institutions control it. The government can't do it. So we have gimmicks like Rwanda, 
where we swap 200 people from somewhere for 200 people from Rwanda. It is going nowhere. And they know they're in a gimmick and all they can do now is try and gaslight us with the consequences that we've got. But there is a way out. We could say we're going to leave the ECHR, which is possible. We won the bigger argument on Brexit. We could win the argument eventually on that one because common sense will prevail. But we could start off by simply disapplying some of the outrageous decisions which okay. the ECHR are putting forward. Frederick Section 39 decision was a, was a legal disgrace, an ex parte legal disgrace. Uh, stay, we can disapply there. those rules. Stay there. I want, to get, I want you to come back on my, what my guest Sam Armstrong is a, is a Conservative commentator is saying. Now, you, Sam Armstrong, back in the studio, with us, you work with a lot of a bunch of sort of Conservative MPs, new Conservatives, who would be seen to be on the right. Again, I'm not entirely sure this right left thing has any meaning anymore, but they want a lot, I mean, an awful lot of the things. You, your MPs will support an awful lot of what uh, Frederick has just been saying. What would you say to uh, uh, voters who were saying, do you know what? I've given up on the Tories. I'm going to vote for, for this man's party. I'm going to vote for Reform UK. At least they, they're saying what I want and, and they, haven't, they haven't proven to, to be liars yet. What would you say to them? I don't lecture voters. I think voters judge politicians fairly. In the round, the British public have never, to my knowledge, really got it that badly wrong. I think if you look back, they normally voted for the, about the right party at about the right given time. Given the choices available to them Given the, the choices available. What I would say to Rishi Sunak is, and to anyone involved in leading the Conservative Party is, there are oven-ready, that phrase again, <laughs> policies ready that would win you masses of support. There is nothing about the 2019 coalition, the biggest coalition of voters that ever assembled for the Conservative Party, that realigned Conservative politics around, right, uh, around working class people mm. often, that has gone away. And they are there, they're ready to be seized okay. at, and you will see off the likes of Frederick with ease if you Frederick, just stopped it. Come back to you, Frederick. Do you think there'll be a deal at the next election if reform continues to grow, you hit you know, 10 points in the polls regularly or, or more, that actually there'll be a deal where, as we saw 2019 election, you know, Brexit Party stood down um, uh, the, a number of candidates from seats of Conservatives, but particularly also from the Conservatives who were pushing for Brexit, in this case, maybe on issues like migrants, that you actually you won't stand against the Tory MPs who vote the right way and talk the right way as you see it? No, that's not going to happen. Uh, I, uh, my colleague, Anne Whittacombe, was, 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 I think, on one of your shows not so very long ago, or, or someone's shows, and she said it quite rightly. This has gone beyond firing warning shots at the Conservatives right. now. This is about putting a hole on their waterline. Okay. And they need to go back into opposition. They need to go and take a good long look at themselves and they need to think about what they stand for. My first voting experience was for Margaret Thatcher, a woman who understood what politics was about, who understood what had to be done and put forward an agenda to do it. We're not looking at a bunch of people that are capable of doing that with whatever deal is put their way at the moment. Right. Uh, thank you. Reform UK spokesman there, Frederick Chenham. Great to have you on the show. Hope you come on again.